We made it happen. Jimmy was an incredible success. I don't know where he is. I gotta find him. Gosh, I don't. Oh, oh, oh. Oh yeah, George, George, oh, George, right George. Here. Yeah. Hey, we did it, brother. We, yes, we hey, did. Thanks to this, you know what? And in the ring with Dan and Chris Denny, hey, brother, man, hey, he's about the most cat. I just love him to death. I love you. Thanks for having me. Hey, you're the best. I'm telling you, brother. In the ring with Dan and Benny. Yeah, we love you. Thank Woo, you so much, Dan. Oh yeah. <laughs> Hello, friends, and welcome to another edition of Dan and Benny the Ring. Happy New Year, everybody. I'm Dan Spaciano, joined, as always, by the player himself, Benny Scala. Benny, 2024, do you think we'd make it this far? Who would have guessed, Dan? And I, I just want to wish everybody out there, including uh, including those listening in the lower region of Tibet, where we have not yet charted, not not yet, a uh, very happy New Year. I, I say it uh, say it all the time, you know, a couple of, couple of friends. I mean, when we when we – Spun off and, and started doing our own thing. You know, I wouldn't have thought 2024 we'd still be chugging along bigger and better than ever, having fun. And uh, we're starting the new year with a great story. Uh, we this gentleman that's joining us has been with us before. Benny wants to tell everybody who the uh, third the third man of today is. Absolutely, Dan. You know, I've, I've kind of become the master of what I would call rabbit hole introductions. So on Thanksgiving Day, 1974, I saw one. Uh, Reggie Dwight perform at Madison Square Garden. Now, most people know him by his kayfabe name, which is Elton John. And one of the many hits that Elton performed that night was uh, Rocket Man. And, well, since we had Dan and Benny in the ring, aims to please. Tonight, we have a real-life Rocket Man. Actually had him on a couple of months ago, but uh, a single hour was just not nearly enough to uh, to capture all his great stories. So, ladies and gentlemen and children of, of all ages, it is my pleasure to once again welcome the Rocket, Fred Curry. Rocket, welcome to Dan and Benny in the Ring. Gentlemen, Happy New Year. Great to be back. Yes, That's likewise. True. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Thanks for yeah. coming. I know the uh, first time we had you on, we got a lot of great stories. I mean, the family history and, and obviously your own. Uh, but I want to kind of jump right back into it. Uh, sure. uh, but we got to start with the obvious. I mean, this is our first show. It's January 2nd, 2024. So first things first. Uh Christmas, New Year's, uh, how was yours? Did you have a good holiday? Oh, it was great. Um, uh, you know, I had all the all the kids at home. Um, the uh, restaurant, the Coast Guard House, where I work, was extraordinarily busy for the holiday season, so that, that kept me moving along, and uh, uh, it was good. It was good. We, we, Drama-free, you know. <laughs> what, what more can you ask? I yeah. cannot be more thankful for what I have, that's for sure. So, well, Fred, I... I, I Talking about the Coast Guard house, I, I saw something online. It was lobster ravioli, and to quote Mickey, Rocky's manager, it's a wake of art. Um, it, was it anywhere near as good as it looked? I know it was, but like I, I think I gained three pounds just looking at it. <laughs> it, it, it is better than it looks. Uh, our kitchen staff, I see them making that from scratch every day, and I'm talking every day. Uh, so it's not one of those situations where they make a batch of it and then they freeze it uh, and to thaw it out and use it. They can't, we can't hold on to it long enough. Where they don't make it every day. So it's I, I got a, Is that one of your biggest sellers? It's got to be close, if not yeah. the biggest, right? Yeah, yeah, it's 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 way up there. That's for sure. It it's very very popular. It's it's. I don't know how good it is for you, but when you're going out to eat at a nice restaurant like that, who cares? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a, we do our, our lobster sherry cream sauce from scratch. Um, it's, you know, New England, so lobsters everywhere abound. So uh, it, it's, it's certainly one of our most popular items, um, primarily seafood restaurant. So, uh, you know, you can get seafood all over the country, but I, and I'm maybe biased, but seafood in New England, New England areas is is the best. You know, yeah. cold water uh, uh, fish is usually the tastiest. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's a, a very popular item. Um, and I'm always proud to pitch it and make people like yourself drool uh, looking at a picture. <laughs> I know some of the. Uh... I, I, I do that anyway because I'm old. 
but uh, <laughs> so, some some of the holiday pictures uh, between you and the and the restaurant. I mean, I, I'm like Benny said. I'm pretty sure my uh, my A1C went up just looking at some of those. I I do have one question um, unrelated to to wrestling, but your restaurant. You guys had some, you know, obviously the the seafood oysters. On your menu, you have your crab cakes listed, and one of the things, sir, with your crab cakes is guacamole. Yes. How does that work? Like, I've never seen or heard of that combination. I've I've eaten crab cakes up and down the coast. Yeah, well, some of our dishes are are inspired by uh, uh, South American flares, Central American. Uh, So the the guacamole is a a spicy guacamole. Um, So the... You know, it, just enough to give you a little kick, and then you have your your uh, aioli on top of the crab cakes, and it's just placed right on top of the spicy guacamole. So the sweetness of the crab, combined with the little spice of the guacamole, really completes the dish. Those are very popular as well. Um, and and uh, you, between seasons, we change up our, our uh, um, setups for a lot of the dishes. So the spicy guacamole is really a wintertime thing. And in the summertime, we go for a little lighter, a little bit more crisp uh, uh, flavor to it. Because when it is 95 degrees along the coastline of Rhode Island, the last thing you want to do is to be sweating because of the <laughs> spicy guacamole. <laughs> right. So we do a good job of changing up our seasonal items. But it's it's, it's terrific. It's a great company. Sounds, sounds our great. culinary team is amazing. You, you heard the man, Benny. If we're going to make our uh, Dan and Benny road trip up to the to up to the northeast we got to go in colder weather i was i was just going to ask you when you prepare the uh the annual dan and benny in the ring budget i think we definitely need to that needs to be a, a definite line item oh, <laughs> i, I, I well, don't know what uh i don't know if they have any specials but maybe we could uh, see see what their deal is on uh last week's clams maybe we could uh <laughs> you don't want those <laughs> lobster hot dogs yeah, i was about i was just about to say given that given what i pay benny maybe we could uh what what's your kids menu look like nothing yeah, but the, fi- the finest mac and cheese and hot dogs for you tater benny. tots <laughs> the chicken tenders maybe, maybe we'll stick with that menu to start off with right. you got, fair enough you know i don't i don't want to worry about you all of a sudden look over and danny benny's not there it's skipped out on the bill again well, i don't you know, know benny. <laughs> benny only likes chicken tenders if they're shaped like dinosaurs so oh, right. uh, don't don't we all <laughs> don't worry i got plenty of ketchup there <laughs> man it's better and better. better well shift <laughs> shifting shifting from food to something uh, else not wrestling related we um we normally on the show we we normally get a lot of baseball references but for a change i want to talk about football i mean like i said we're recording this episode december 2nd we just had bowl season last week uh you know, I, I was a Maryland boy. It was nice to see see them beat Auburn. Uh, but you, I, I really felt. I mean, you're 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 on mater. I really felt for you. Ohio State uh, was expected to go in and make some noise, and they were held to three points. Missouri got them in the Cotton Bowl. I I know it's not probably not your favorite subject right now, but what are your thoughts on uh, how how the the Ohio State ended their year? Oh well, okay. So first of all, you have the one two matchup with their most famous rival Michigan up there in that school up north they fall short at six points uh because of an interception at the last minute so like you know whoever was going to win that game was going to be number one in the country and to lose to those guys particularly three years in a row stings really bad the sad part okay so you miss out on the playoff now next year uh, the college playoff is going to extend to 12 teams, so everybody's going to get in. I don't know, oh, okay. uh, you know, that's how great that is. But, you know, Ohio State going to the Cotton Bowl uh, with the transfer portal now, which means players can switch teams on a whim in college now. Uh, and with some of their better players expecting to go in the NFL draft in the Cotton Bowl, not me, to, to it. they're starting all their third stringers, their freshmen. Uh, so, you know, you watch that game or try to watch that game and they only put up three points when they were putting up like 45 points all year is it, rather disheartening. And, you know, from an alumni point and a fan, it's like, come on guys, you gotta finish strong, but you know, it's a different culture. It's, a, it, it's, it's too bad because, uh, you know, it's almost like uh, becoming like the NBA. You remember what, back in the 
day, the 90s, 80s, you could stick with an NBA team because it'd be the same team every year. Now it's it changes every year. How can you get behind a product that doesn't stay true to itself? So I hope that doesn't happen in college football. That game stunk. It was embarrassing. They lose to Missouri by three points. Uh, but the loss by Florida State by 63 points to Georgia you know, made it sting a little less. But yeah. neither here, nor, here nor there, you know, we had another season. And to be an Ohio State uh, alumni and fan when you don't um, win out, particularly beating Michigan uh, in the college football year, it's a long, long offseason waiting to get another shot. There's nothing like college football if you're from a college football area. Oh, it yeah. is like, Absolutely, it's yeah. so big time. and. The fans are so passionate. So, you know, my wife, <laughs> she's watching me watch that uh, Michigan game. And, uh, you know, she doesn't understand. She's from uh, up here in, in New England where college football isn't that big a deal. And she's like, I just don't get it. And I'm like, don't bother me. I'm watching this game. <laughs> You're not going to get it. Don't worry about it. But uh, it was disheartening. But there's next year. There's always hope. Didn't, uh, didn't Urban Meyer kind of have Michigan's number, though, when he was coach? Oh, yeah. Uh, Urban Meyer never lost to Michigan. So right. Jim Harbaugh, who's a coach of Michigan, lost eight in a row to Ohio State before winning the last three. They were going to fire him. Right, like, right, he, because he couldn't right. beat Ohio State, right? Yeah, now the guy's in the national championship. But that's that's <laughs> that's how life goes, whether it's football or wrestling, as my grandfather says. Today's news, tomorrow's toilet paper. You never know. Yeah. What's right. going to happen? You just have to, have to stick true to yourself and evolve. I mean, like. Clearly, the, <clears throat> they just needed to steal more signals from Ohio. That was the problem. Uh, right. <laughs> you, you know, you, you mentioned the uh, how, how college balls change in and, and the loss, you know, Florida, Florida uh, FSU losing to Georgia. Correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't it something like between the two teams? It was something like almost 60 players. That, that, yeah. that didn't play because of, of transfer portal or choosing to sit. I mean, yeah. you know, you're, you're imagine being a, a fan or, I mean, I think when I was like, when I went to Maryland, you know, being a fan, getting your ticket, getting excited to go to the bowl game and you're watching third, fourth stringers in Florida state's K or FSU's case. They was what the only the second time since high school, that kid had started a football game. Like, you know, yeah. you're well, that, a manager. It, it's, it's entirely disappointing. Ohio state's quarterback, was number thirty three. I didn't know who that kid was. Yeah, uh, and and um, uh, it's it's just you know it, it's it's terrible. And you're right. It was like sixty some players, so it's tough as a fan. Um, but like again, with the college football landscape, next year or the year after, the Big Ten is going to have USC and UCLA in it. Yeah, you're going to have what six, 16, 16 teams or eighteen teams in the Big Ten. Yeah, but and it's it, it waters it down. It waters down the product, just like wrestling can get watered down because you're doing too much. It's not a regional thing anymore. That was a cool thing about college yeah. football is is it was regionally at Big Ten going against a Pac Ten and the Rose Bowl teams that are never going to play each other. Now they're all going to play each other all year round. Who gives, who gives a crap? It's it's. I mean, I I look I at it like when when I went to Maryland, they were fighting over the ACC championship because that was before they left for the big 10 and now with, with, I mean, they've added Louisville and now they've, they're, they're going to add Cal and Stanford. I mean, you could very well next wow. year. Well, this year, I mean, when, when, uh, Florida state beat Louisville in the ACC championship, you could have two teams with that the don't have Atlantic coastlines yeah. fighting over the Atlantic coast championship. It's ridiculous, right? You know, a team from yeah. California is going to be the Atlantic coast champion. Like how that just doesn't feel right to me. No, no, it, it, it takes away from it a lot because uh, you know, regional rivalries are very important because they're exciting for people in the regions. And you want to see matchups that you never see before. You don't want to watch the same thing that you can see during the season. It's right. like, been there, done that. I, I, I don't know. It just, it, it's fun being devoted to where you're from. Whereas, and it's it's not harmful. Competition isn't harmful. Being proud of where you're from isn't harmful, even though it tries to be painted that way sometimes. It's not. It's exciting. It's fun. It's called fun. And um, you know, putting all these guys in the same conference is just like, why should there be any conference? 
right? Notre Dame, you yeah. know. Well, perfect segue, Fred, into the first wrestling question, even though not necessarily regarding your career, but it's, it's more regarding the current product. And you're talking about like diluted you know, product. But I just read something that between AEW and TNA, they have a total of 14 titles. Now, both your grandfather and your dad were products of the, the territory days. And typically a territory would have maybe that like that region or United States tag team title, and then maybe, you know, the tag team title. Uh, and both your grandfather and, and your dad won multiple championships. But at that time, uh, you know, a territory championship, like I, I know your grandfather won the, the Brass Knucks in Texas, which was a, a very, very prestigious title numerous times. And uh, so I just feel like, you know, if everybody in a territory or a promotion is wearing a belt, then a, a championship really is meaningless. And I was just kind of wondering how you, how you wanted to weigh in on that. If everybody is special, then nobody is. Nobody. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we talk about watering down the product of football. I'm perfect segue into uh, wrestling, as you say. You know, you watch AEW television. They've got all these Ring of Honor titles and all these AEW titles. Every match is a title match. Who cares after a while? Where's the luster on the belt? The, the, the Ric Flair holding the the National Wrestling Alliance World Championship for as long as he did made it special, made it important. Every time he would go to a different territory, he would be a money draw because the title never changed. And there was only one. Uh, whereas, you know, the, the WWF title was special too. But I mean, you look at uh, WWF titles. There's too many of those, too. They had a universal title, now they've got a world championship, now they've got a heavyweight championship. Just leave it on reins and be done with it. This way, everybody's chasing. Now, they've done a better job than most. But when you talk about the territories, back to Ric Flair being the National Wrestling Alliance champion, or Dory Funk, or Harley Race. Risco, yeah, sure. Risco, all these guys held the titles for a long period of time. Yeah. And being the champion was not only being the best but being the most dependable champion all right they put the title on Kerry von eric in texas stadium and they took it off of him in 13 days because they couldn't trust the product uh which is another conversation for another time yeah but dwindling down these these belts to mean something is is so important the wwf in the 80s and 90s the world heavyweight championship and the intercontinental championship were important because that's all there was to it. And the Intercontinental Belt was a stepping stone to get to the world title. Correct. It only makes sense if you have eight matches on a card and everybody's fighting for a title, that means everybody's gonna have a title. And who cares? How can you draw? How can you how can you make people devoted to you? Like we we're talking about with college football. Why am I gonna trust this product if there's 18 champions and the belt changes every three weeks? And I don't know what it's for. You know, territories, it meant something. The Sheik and the Detroit Territory. Okay, all the territories had their own heavyweight champions because there wasn't cable back then. There wasn't pay-per-view. So the local TV was all it was. So that's all the people watching that area knew who the title was. But it was on the Sheik all the time. And maybe it, he held on to a little too tight. But when Bobo Brazil beat him for the U.S. Heavyweight Championship, it was a big deal. And the next right. time they came to, to go to the next show in Kobo or the Joe Louis Arena, sold tickets. And the people got behind the champ. It was always the baby face chasing the, the heel champ. It was a beautiful, poetic uh, formula. Now, I mean, too many of them. And it, it waters it down. It makes them less special. Um, you know, it's it's – I don't like it, but, I mean – Still a fan, but but the, the, you can't you cannot you gotta keep it simple. Can't overcomplicate uh, wrestling storylines or or the way uh, titles play out or the personnel or anything like that. Keep it simple. This way, the people can follow it. You can't confuse the fans. If there's if there's nine titles, who are they supposed to cheer for? Who are they supposed to get behind? What are they supposed to look forward to? So that's my opinion on it anyway. 
You know, but and you just mentioned Flair, but but you know, going in reverse though, when Flair or you know or Race or Briscoe or Dory when they toured the country and they hit each territory, so what they would do, like just say for example, in Memphis, you know, whoever the Southern Heavyweight Champion was, which was you know in most cases Lawler, or you yeah. know the down in Florida, the Florida Heavyweight Champion, who were you know, what, so they would you know Flair would wrestle the regional champion, and of course he'd leave it to belt, but in the process. He made that, you know, that guy look like a million bucks. Yeah. So that, you know, even though he may, might not have captured the title from Flair, he came like yay close. And that, you know, but that helped the territory when 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 Flair or whoever left, because like my, man, my guy, is, he almost beat the champ, the world champ. That's right. That 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 made that title uh, uh, more important. It put it right. over. It, it, it elevated. It. Um, it, it wasn't very complicated, but it just it worked. You know. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, was, it was great. You know, it, it made it made your local heroes look even better because they went toe to toe with the man. And, right. uh, you know, like we said, keeping it simple like that simple story. And another thing about these world heavyweight champions, they would go from territory to territory. And they they could either be a heel or a baby face, depending on who they were going against in the territory. And they would adjust to it, like Dory Funk, for instance, uh, when he held the title for four years. He could go into an area and wrestle their champion, and not necessarily wrestle like a, a uh, you know, a crotch kicking, uh, neck poking, eye poking heel, but he would be a little heelish, depending on who he was going against. Bend, bend the rules a little bit, right? Like, mm-hmm. bend, bend the rules a little, get a little uh, irritated, a little angry, lose his patience. Whereas you go in another territory, like you go down to Amarillo and be straight baby face. That's how talented these guys were, where they could do the subtleties of, of changing their mannerisms to be either a heel or face whatever that territory and that territory's champ required. That's why they were the world champs. They were the yeah. best at what they did. Absolutely. And it made business better for everybody. Right. And go, it did, they, yeah. They didn't go into some territory and bury the, the champ. You know, just to put themselves over. It wasn't none of that. It was all what was good for business because they made more money when they made a territory look good because they were going to come back. Yeah. And they'd get paid. Yeah. How Very many simple. one hour draws did like Harley Race or Flair do like while they tour in the country? Oh, yeah. All the time. And, and the people never lost patience with it because uh, this is the only time they're going to see these guys go at it for a right. long time. So yeah, you know, if you it was, saw it, it was special, yeah. If you saw yeah. it every week, it, it, I mean, we, <clears throat> Benny, we we were just uh, over the break. We both participated in a a series of comments on a Facebook post. Somebody broke it down, and over the last what was it, just a couple weeks, and I, and I hate to sound like I'm picking on it, but just the last few weeks of AEW programming, there were 15 different titles on screen, and like because some of them are three man championships you had 21 different people uh in the course of two weeks come out wearing a belt yeah it's crazy it so, means nothing yeah it's so boring because of that you know six man title what the heck come on I, you know it, it, who cares i mean they're, they're nothing against ring of honor it went it was great back in the day but now it's nothing it doesn't mean anything who who what, what casual viewer is going to know what the hell they're talking about for a company that doesn't even have its own TV anymore. And why are these titles on the same show as the AEW titles? And why is there a six man? And why is there a tag team? And why, why a TNT champ, a world champ? I, I, I don't know what they're doing over there. They're getting a little too uh, busy with themselves as far as, I, I don't know. There, it seems like there's too many, uh, too, too many chefs in the kitchen. Almost as many titles as they have viewers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I said I, I gave them a, a pass at least. The WWE w- did a good job for a while uh, when they had two world champions because it did feel like Raw and SmackDown were independent of themselves. But when you start crossing brands as often as they do with stars and yeah. when Roman was still carrying multiple belts while there was another world championship, it, it started to kind of, water it down i think they're they're going back to 
uh, especially now with the, uh, I guess, the, the rumblings, rumor, whatever you want to call it, because the title Roman has is unified with the with the old yeah. Universal title, that he's yeah. the he's the undisputed WWE Universal Heavyweight Champion, that mm-hmm. when he finally loses the belt, they're just going to call it the WWE title again, which is funny, because Benny, we've, we've mentioned it on the show, where they talk about, oh, he if he keeps the belt until September, he'll break Hogan's reign, and he's already third. He just he passed Backlund uh, last year, and it's like, well, wait a minute. No, he hasn't been WWE champion. He was Universal champion for two years before he won the WWE title. So and like, he wrestled. He wrestled eleven times in twenty twenty three. And and they weren't all title matches. But yeah, yeah. Well, I, I it looks like they're getting by back to unifying it, um, and which is what they should do. It was getting a little complicated. I mean. I don't know what I, I don't know what they're going to do with Rollins' title, or whether they're going to keep that or whatever. But it, it seems like WWE television is getting a little better. You know, it's too bad because all elite wrestling it was nice to have an alternative, and they started off and they were they were pretty hot and it was okay, but they've cooled significantly. Whereas, and I'm sure you guys talk about this all the time. Whereas WWE has got accelerated. I mean, they've actually developed stars and. Mm-hmm. brought back stars and it, it's really kind of interesting um because they're they're going back to making it more simple where the people can follow what they're doing who the baby faces are who the heels are you know modern wrestling fans they're so determined to tell you that it doesn't matter who's the baby face and who's the heel it's just a wrestler against a wrestler Bull crap you have to know who to cheer and who's how are you going to invest yourself into watching a match if it's just two guys or girls just beating each other up with no emotion no goal no no animosity come on it's 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 the soundtrack for every excellent action movie ever made it's not difficult to understand there has to be a good person and a bad person. That's all there is to it. Good Simple. versus evil. Yep. Yeah, yeah you, you would think so. Why? Why is the yin and yang is an ancient symbol that <laughs> expresses just that? They right. knew what they were talking about thousands of years ago. Okay, very easy. Hmm. But um, kind of getting back on on topic uh, before we, I mean. We said we wanted to talk, obviously, your career. Before we get to your career, we I wanted to talk about your dad, uh, Flying Fred Curry. We we really didn't get that to chat about him that much on your your first appearance. Uh, I mean, he had a great career. Many won uh, numerous regional championships. Even had a run in the WWF in 1979. Uh, he teamed with Ivan Putsky for a bit and had a title match with uh, for the WWF Tag Team Championships against the Valiant Brothers. Which I mean, we've mentioned before, Benny. I don't think we could say enough good things about. How anybody that stepped in the ring with the Valiant Brothers, that was an honor. Yeah. And I mean, he, he was one of the first wrestlers to really heavily feature aerial maneuvers. I would really was kind of hoping you could tell us more about, about your dad. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, okay, so my father grew up in the wrestling business, of course. My grandfather was always on the road. Um, in the summertime, uh, my father would travel with him, whether he was going to Nova Scotia or Texas or wherever it happened to be so he was grew up around the business you know during the year school year they wouldn't even see my grandfather hardly ever because back in those days those guys would work every day and if they didn't work they didn't get paid so that was the way you were only way you're going to make a living so my father ended up going to UConn University of Connecticut he played football there on a scholarship uh he graduated in 1963 uh, and then he automatically got into the wrestling business. Well, he, he graduated with a major in education. So he um, he would do like teaching part time, but he pretty much got into the business right away. I guess the way it goes is uh, my grandfather was working a show in Boston and um, they went in the yard and they, you know, my father's always partial to the arrow moves and, and things like that. He was a stark contrast to my, my grandfather. My grandfather, brawler, snarling heel. Yep. My father was a good-looking, baby face, technical, high-flying wrestler. So they did some 
spots and some falls and whatever in the yard. And, and my grandfather said, okay, you're working on the show tonight. So that, no wrestling school back then. Okay, you learn, you just went in the ring. So his first match in the Boston Gardens was against Boris Malenko. Oof, wow. Mm-hmm. Boris, Boris Malenko is Dean Malenko's father. Right? Oh, yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, I don't know what happened in the match. I'm sure Boris probably went over, but my father didn't really know what he was doing, uh, really. So I guess Boris gets back into the locker room and just goes to my grandfather and said, that kid's stiff. <laughs> <laughs> stiff wrestling business means, you know, you, you're not light. You, you, when you're throwing a punch or something, you're really clocking the guy. And you don't want to necessarily be stiff because there's no line. Yeah. So uh, that was the first encounter. And really, my father's first big push was going to the Detroit Territory where the Sheik was the promoter. Um, actually, let me, let me backpedal a little bit. Before that, he went down to Texas, to Dallas, the Dallas Territory, very young Man, it wasn't Flying Fred Curry. It was uh, Bullet Curry or Kid Curry or something like that. And he worked with Fritz Von Erich a lot. And they tagged down there a few times. Fritz took a shining to my father. And my father, to this day, admires Fritz Von Erich uh, amazingly. There's nothing but reverence for Fritz. So after that summer there, then they went up to Detroit with Sheik. Uh, and then she put him in the right matches and, did, and called him Flying Fred Curry. And from there, they went on. He traveled to Sheik's territory, worked mainly out of the Detroit territory. He did have different stints um, in different areas in Canada. He did. Uh, he wrestled in California. He wrestled in Cow Palace against Gene Kaninsky in a title match when Gene Kaninsky was a world heavyweight champion. Oh, wow. Okay. And he uh, worked in the Hawaiian territory where he was the Hawaiian heavyweight champion for a better part of a year. Uh, he worked in Australia where he tagged with Jack Briscoe um, for uh, Jim Barnett, ran the territory down there. Right. Um, 1973, he was PWI most popular wrestler of the year and shared it with Jack Briscoe. Uh, so he, he made his way around. He, he wrestled for a, a good amount of time. I uh, did stints in Japan. Uh, he was always a baby face, though. He never turned heel. Uh, and he was highly noted for his draft pick. So I remember being in the California Alley Club in Las Vegas. We were inducting my grandfather into the Hall of Fame. And Bobby Heenan was the MC. So what better MC can you have than Bobby Heenan, right? Right. Uh, so my father's up there with me and we're accepting the award and, and Bobby Heenan goes on the microphone. He goes, you know, flying Fred Curry over there is one hell of a baby face. Uh, and he told the story of when he was in the, the Detroit territory, Bobby Heenan as a young wrestler, he, uh, she, or whoever, he didn't say it by name, but he was, he was told to go in there take 14 drop kicks, take the pin and get out of here. That's how he would do it, called machine gun drop kicks. So he did a guy with 10, 12, 14, and the fans would chomp, champ, one, two, three, four, all those drop kicks. Um, and Bobby Heenan said, he told me to take 14. He goes, I took three, and then I powdered out of the ring and got called, I counted out. He wasn't going to take 14 of them. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's in, in short, that's a little uh, – Introduction of Flying Fred's career in professional wrestling. He wrestled for the better part of, I would say, 1963 to 1981, 82. And in the summer times, he would still take gigs. Uh, and he, he would let me travel with him. And that was my introduction to wrestling. But he, he didn't have to, like your, your grandfather, I mean, he was, what, in his mid-60s? Yeah. Uh, when he, when, yeah, your dad wanted to, I mean, he did, what, about 20 years? Yeah, about 20 years. But you, you'll see as as a, <laughs> as having a wrestler with longevity, particularly back in those days, you get a Wild Bull Curry or, uh, you know, those kind of guys, they didn't take too many chances. So he could wrestle, and he didn't change his style. So he could wrestle for 40, 50 years. Whereas if you're an aerial wrestler, Right, you, you're inevitably going to take uh, take injuries, so you can only do it so long. I don't care what any of them say. They're like, 
Uh, my father uh, ruptured his Achilles and then he separated his shoulder. And, you know, you, you take all these aerial bumps just like I did. Uh, you're going to miss time it every once in a while. And you just can't keep doing it forever. You think you can at the time. You're 23 years old. You're like, I'm going to do this all the time. But it, it, eventually your body says, get lost. Your body, your body tells a story. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, you watch like Darby Allen and all these goofy wrestlers taking these bumps on the apron of the ring. Now, they are crazy. Their backs are going to be crooked. There's no way. You're not supposed to bump on the apron. You are not. I was taught that. Do not yeah. take bumps on the apron because it doesn't give. And there's a corner there. These guys take Death Valley drivers on. I mean, the backdrops. It's crazy. They're not going to be doing this stuff in 15, 10, 15 years. No way. Mm -hmm. The only right. human. Look at Omega. He, he, he's 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 almost on his way out because of the, the style he works. He, he's so injured again because you just can't keep doing that. Yeah. It's impossible. Not great. So hey, your uh, your your dad wasn't taking those bumps onto piles of furniture and stuff either. Right. Well, well, no. Well, uh, let me rephrase that. Your your dad wasn't taking bumps like that into piles of furniture every week. No, 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 no. Because these guys would have to wrestle. You know, uh, seven to ten times a week. When when he was wrestling for WWF, he had two different stints with him, and the one you talked about was probably his most successful one in seventy eight, seventy nine. Um, and I mean, they would do uh, the, the six days of, of live shows. Maybe you had a Madison Square Garden show in there, and then they would go to Allentown uh, or or uh, White Plains and do their television taping. So they would do like three, four five shows in a, in a taping. Uh, that's a, those were the days when Vince McMahon was doing the commentary along with Bruno. Right. Uh, watching some of those uh, tapings, it's it's kind of like, yeah, not all of it was very good. But it's, it's strange to see what the product has done. Now, my father did take some, he did take his fair share of bad bumps. Like there was a story when he was in Texas, I forget which area, whether it was Houston or Dallas, he was working a cage match. And um, he got on the outside of the cage and it was wood and nails. And, uh, you know, not like the cages now, you know, they, the budgets weren't quite the same back then. He was coming off the cage and he got, his shoulder got caught on one of the bolts sticking out. He was hanging there like a slab of meat off the, off the, off the nail. Yeah. So they had to come and get him and, uh, and uh, get him off the nail. He drove there with my grandfather that night, uh, and my grandfather was so pissed off at him for taking a risk that he left him at the arena. So fans had to take my father to the to the hospital. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, 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 you, you know, because you didn't, you weren't supposed to take those chances unless you were getting paid a lot of money. And then my father told me another story about he was wrestling George Steele. Uh, George Animal Steel, and they were working in some building that had an orchestra pit behind the ring. And George Steel was so powerful that uh, he, Dad liked to take backdrops from him because he would get you way up there. Uh, he he catapulted him too too much, so he went over the top rope into the orchestra pit, <laughs> like like ten feet below where the floor was. And oh, no. he, he wrecked. So that was a dangerous bump too. But he used to get angry with me um, when I would take chances, you know, dives and all that. Because, like I said before, you know, you, you're in your 20s, you think you think you'd do anything. So he was always a, so he's kind of hard on me about unnecessary bumps, as he says. So, but you know, even though he didn't take those crazy bumps or 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 do that stuff every night, you can only last so long. So that's why his career was so much shorter than my grandpa. He did have, so we always use, it's called WrestlingData.com. And I, you know, in preparation for the, for this interview, I looked at his one loss record. And, you know, even got like a guy like Ivan Koloff, who you would think would be, you know, have a huge, like a very high winning percentage. You pretty much you know, won as many as he, or lost as many as he won. But your dad, like, won, at least, you know, according to WrestlingData.com, about 70% of his matches, which is very, very unusual. For, for any wrestler. So I was just kind of curious about that. He, um, he, his role usually 
was as a fiery baby face to, to get the crowd going to the little kids, the, the, the females in the audience, uh, things like that. And he would, he, his championship runs were always usually in tag teams. So he would be the guy that gets the hot tag and starts throwing the drop kicks. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, and they would usually win because it was a baby face tag team champions or whatever. And then when he would work during the show, unless he was in a main event, you know, against the Sheik, he would always be placed, particularly in Detroit territory, uh, against the, you know, uh, uh, Dr. X or just some basic heel to kind of get the crowd going uh, where, you know, they wanted him to beat this guy. He would showcase all of his aerial tactics and acrobatic capability. And it, it was, you know, the role of it, of, of him was to, to, uh, make the crowd enthusiastic to get them excited. Um, so he wasn't going to be in a long technical match where, um, you know, trading holes or anything like that. Not to say he couldn't, but, it, but his role was clear as far as being the excitement to the card. Um, right. So you're going to, you're going to win most of the time. You're not going to have the exciting guy uh, lose, you know, it, it, because it's just the payoff for it for the fans is, is not what they want. You know, you, and you mentioned, you know, him being in uh, the WWF with the uh, the TV tapings. I saw one over the weekend with him against Johnny Rods where it was exactly that. I mean, it was probably something to get the, the crowd all fired up, but he nailed Rods with about three drop kicks in a row, went off the ropes and then nailed him with a you know, flying body press for the yep. pin. And I mean, the crowd really popped for him. Yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. That's exactly what he, he would do, you know. You go against uh, uh, Victor Rivera, same thing. Um, <clears throat> or he would tag with Putsky. And if you ever watch those matches against the Valiants, that was always the case where Putsky was the muscle and uh, Flying Fred was was the speed. And um, uh, he, my father hated working for the WWF uh, immensely because the, the uh, road work was tough. Like I said, you know, they would do all those days and do five TV tapings in a row. And uh, the workers up there were not easy. So when you watch some of those MSG shows, if you have a chance, you have, you have Peacock or whatever, watch those shows and you'll see the matches um, are kind of sloppy because they didn't give each other a lot. And they didn't talk over their stuff in the back and they didn't walk through anything. Uh, but you know, nobody really wanted to give each other a lot of ground. So if you watch my father in a match with say Alan Coge, uh, uh, Bad News Brown, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it was so much bigger than my father. It was very difficult for my father to get anything in on it because he wouldn't let him. You, having an eye for it, you could see it when you watch it. So my father was like, he was like being in a fight every night um, just to get your stuff over. And there were some guys that took better to it, like Rivera and, and Johnny Rods, uh, you know, cause they, you know, special delivery Jones. I mean, they had their, they had their roles. They knew what it was, but other guys, it was, it was hard to get across with. Like if he wrestled the Valiants, which he did a lot, a, a lot of times, he would always like to work with Jimmy the most because Jimmy would get him over. Uh, Jimmy Valiant's great. And in yeah. all, in all of Jimmy Valiant's, uh, uh, character changes. He was always great. He was always original. He was always fresh. We saw him uh, a few years ago. I think it was when my dad was getting inducted into the New England Hall of Fame. Or maybe it was me. I don't remember. Um, but the, watching those guys talk was like old times. You know, he, you know, you see like Jimmy Valiant through his promos as the Boogie Woogie Man or whatever, and he's crazy. But to see him in person, he's very quiet, very calm. He is. He really is. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, but uh, so yeah, working for WWF and stuff. He, and I and, the, and I was a baby at the time, so he didn't like being away from home uh, as much as he had to. That, yeah, uh, that makes sense. But but it was you know different experiences. All those territories were different. You had guys that you worked with well, and you had guys that were jerks. It's life, you know. Yeah, <clears throat> right. Kind of like any any workplace. Yeah, any yeah. workplace.
So, Fred, uh, you said something because I listened to the, your previous interview uh, this weekend. You said something that that caught my ear, and I wanted you to elaborate on. You you mentioned that you liked working as a heel in Worcester, Massachusetts, because you didn't like the people there. So, I wanted to hear that story. <laughs> no, I didn't like the people. They didn't like me, and I didn't like them. I there was a few areas like that. Pretty much, I would say eighty five percent of my wrestling career has been babyface. But there were some places, some areas where you're just not going to get over as babyface because they don't want, you know, the white meat heroes. They don't want to cheer the good guys. They want to boo the good guys, cheer the bad guys. So, like, a place like Worcester or Philly or Jersey, they're all like that. Um, so, Worcester, I, I was working a pretty steady uh, gig up there, like once a month, once, twice a month. And they drew big houses and all that. They tried to bring me as the rocket, you know, hopping up and down, drop kicks, all that, all those things. And the people just would turn on me every chance they got. So I just, I told a promoter, I just went with it. And I stopped, and I stopped working as a baby face. And I just started jaw jacking as a heel. And, and um, you know, if I threw a drop kick, it would be like a Mr. Perfect kind of drop kick, like slapping the guy around and hitting a, pretty one and then you know showing off all those things i got from watching people throughout the year but it was easier for me to be a heel there and i was more successful as a heel because i meant it. uh <laughs> and it, just like any heel it got to the point where they started to enjoy it so much so then they started to cheer me in it. and by that time I was, I was getting out of it anyway but there were there were different places like that where you know if you go to like newport vermont um they're gonna cheer me all day of the week for doing nothing because they're so excited to see wrestling there. And they want to see the good guy and the bad guy. But then you send me as, as a baby face down to uh, uh, Trenton, New Jersey, or, or Philly, or South Philly. No, <laughs> they ain't going for me as a baby face at all. And that's fine. That's okay. You know, it's easier to work here. <laughs> you know, Wait. they say, the, they say the, uh, the best characters are just the real you turned up to 11. So you just more that's, naturally played yourself that, when you were a heel. Is that what you're saying? That's right. Well, that's that was a situational thing. It's just like being successful as a baby thing. Uh, and, you know, it's funny in the restaurant industry how everything I have done in wrestling or learned in wrestling is transferable to the restaurant. So when I, I do these little talks called pre-meals and, you get the employees ready for the day, the servers, the sport, all those guys. So basically, I tell them the same thing because what they're doing is putting on a performance uh, and they're being a part of them. But I tell them the same thing I tell wrestlers. You cannot fake it. You cannot, you, you, you can't be impartial. Some of you has to be in what you're pitching to people. You have to believe in what you're doing because if you don't believe it, they're not going to believe it. And that's the same in wrestling. If you don't believe in what you're doing, you don't buy into your storyline, you don't buy into the pitch of the match or whatever angle you're doing or whatever you're trying to accomplish. If you don't, in your mind, believe this scenario and you just try to walk through it, it's going to look fake. And if it looks fake, it's fake to the people. And that's a very controversial word, fake. And one thing's for certain in wrestling, you don't want that word to have anything to do with you. So that's like when you watch these people do, uh, you can tell uh, mm -hmm. when like WWE on Raw, when they're doing a scripted interview. And it, it's, you know, it just sounds like crap because it's hollow. They read it. Uh, right. They've been told to say it. They don't believe what they're doing. But, but then you watch like CM Punk cut a promo or The Rock or Cena. They're buying into what they're talking about. Part of what they're doing out there, like you said, is a part of themselves up to 11. But the, the key component of that is you have to believe in what you're doing. So whenever I was working heel or I was working baby face, I would just buy in to the situation. And if I, once I got to a point where I couldn't buy into it or I didn't want to or I wasn't enthusiastic about it anymore, it's time to call it a day. Don't do that to the fans. Don't do that to yourself. You know, I kind of want to expand on something. You were talking about uh, even playing a heel. You said, you know, Northeast, they'd always cheer you. You said something on the uh, on your last appearance. 
you mentioned that, that there are other you talked about there's no more territories we know that system's dead you did say there are regions each region has a unique style and the fans tend to associate with that so kind of expand on that a little bit like how can you tell okay this is a philly guy this is a chicago guy this guy trained in florida like how, how do you what, what kind of what kind of markers what do you look for in that well it's more along the lines of uh wherever their home base is whatever their region is it's what the fans go for there it's what they want there that kind of uh molds them into the wrestling personality they have so if you're talking about like Philadelphia, New Jersey, places like that, they, they want blood. They 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 are hungry for violence. They don't want a rah rah kind of thing. They 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 want a rough looking. They want Eddie Kingston, is what they want. They don't want they don't want Rock and Fred Curry. Trust me. But if you go to New England, certain parts of New England are different, and it, it characterizes what kind of worker you are. So like I uh, shadowed to before, if you're in Vermont or Maine, for instance, they're excited for anything you do. They just want entertainment. So if you're a worker out of there, you are invested into the baby face and heel dichotomy of how you work your matches. Um, if you're down in, in uh, Virginia or North Carolina, you're going to be a workhorse. You're going to you're going to do long, meaning, meaningful psychological matches uh, that isn't necessarily driven with spots, but it's scattered throughout. And that's the way you work. Those guys are very technical with their switches, with the reversals, all of those things that they're, they're very, very good. Um, Midwest, same kind of thing. Uh, the fans are hot. Uh, they buy into the uh, baby face heel dichotomy as well. Whereas if you go to the West Coast, they want spots. They want orchestrated, and I'm not talking about everything. Okay, it's it's just it, it, you see it. They, you know, you look at like a match, a lucha match that you see in California, right? And you take, you take that same match to Virginia, and it's just not going to get over the same way. Oh, Whereas, you know, the invisible grenade is going to go over really well over there. But if you did that in Maine, they would be like, "What the? What are you doing? What the hell's going on here?" It's just like in Pennsylvania, where when Chikara was hot. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Chikara, but they basically, that was Mike Quackenbush's group. Uh, and they would dress as characters, and it would be gimmicky, and they would do silly spots. And the people out there love that crap. But if you did that down in certain parts of uh, Louisiana or Florida, they, they'd be out of the building. So it really, it really characterizes what kind of worker you are. And... You know, the successful ones can can uh, diverse their range wherever they happen to go. But it's important to know what kind of crowds you're, you're, you're going to see. Um, but when you don't when you see a, a guy that's from an area that hasn't ever been to another area, you know, you kind of know you're like, OK, that, that, <laughs> that guy's from Carolina or, or, you know, it's not an insult. It just. It's 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 their it's the way they the way they work, um, but you know you shake that by by working in different areas and with different people. Um, but it, there are differences, like 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 I said, it's not territories. But you know, it's funny; it kind of follows uh, yes. what the territory used to be. Um, whereas, you know, back in the territory days, uh, if you're talking about Crockett. Down in uh, 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 Carolinas, you have a certain kind of wrestling. Uh, and then you come up to the Northeast with WWF or WWF. You, you get the reliance on the baby faces and heels and the larger than life looking characters. And then you go to Detroit territory. It, it, it kind of trickles down throughout the ages. That's for sure. Well, Benny, it looks like a, another great conversation. We always have a lot of fun. Um, final thoughts to you? Final question to you? Yeah, I was going to ask Fred if uh, he has any resolutions or goals for the year 2024. <laughs> My goals for the year 2024, let's see. Uh, I don't know, to, uh, to, to, to better the, the restaurant, Coast Guard House, where I'm at, um, uh, to just spend as much time with my family as I can. Maybe lose a couple pounds. You know, stay away from that lobster ravioli. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's very easy to get lost in it. Um, Possible. 
And, uh, you know, just staying healthy is the most important thing. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. That, and with, with you staying healthy in your mind and in, in your heart and in, in your soul is, is very important to be a success, successful individual as a, as a businessman or as a wrestler or as a, a podcast commentary, having your clear conscious and, and knowing where your goals are and where you want to be is, is an important part of being a good person. And, you know, New Year's resolutions are funny and, and some people are like, oh, it doesn't matter. No, flipping the switch is important. You, you know, you can't ever stay settled. You always have to, to, to reach forward. And that's that's where I'm at. That's where I'm going in uh, 2024. I hope you guys have a wonderful year, too. I always enjoy being on the show. I'll tell you that. Yeah, it's it's great. yeah, it's always a pleasure having you. Um, before we go, I do have one one final thing. Um, for for this is more for our our YouTube side than our audio listeners. Before we started, uh, it's it's out of focus on your camera. I was hoping you could tell our listeners the story of that picture that's next to you. This picture here, I don't know if I can get it in focus. I'll try, but it's a picture of my grandfather, and it was painted by the original sheik. Um, like I told you guys earlier, oh, almost. Anyway, uh, the original Sheik in my family was very close, particularly with my grandfather and my father. Uh, original Sheik at Fairhat went to my first match uh, uh, and my second match where I tagged with Sabu. Um, so as the Sheik got older, as many uh, wrestlers do, there it is, uh, he, did, oh, yeah. he, would paint, he would do oil paintings. Uh, and so one of the oil paintings he did was on my grandfather right here. And he signed it in Arabic down here. And it says to grandson of uh, Bull Curry. And it's one of my most special possessions. My brother, Nick, he's always trying to take it from me. I'm like, you weren't even around back then. Get out of here. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I, I just I, I thought it was a pretty cool thing to show. And it's something you're, you're not normally going to see. And it's it's very special to to have it, it, to, to the fact that he had me on his mind when he painted this is, is special to me. So, uh, you know, I want to come show it and bring it on the show. Oh, that's that's a, great. It's, that's a great story. And it like is, you said, yeah. I mean, he, the fact that he signed, I mean, he signed it in Arabic, but the fact that he signed it, because like you mentioned before we started recording tonight, his autograph is one of the rarest in, yeah. in all of wrestling collectibles. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It's great. Uh, and, and like we were talking about earlier before we started airing, you know, being around the Sheik, um, he was always in character. You know, like you talk about kayfabe and, and uh, you know, he, he would never break his persona. Like he, he would never sell that he could speak English or any of that stuff. He'd always be the Sheik. You know, <laughs> you know he's crazy. Uh, uh, but I, I, you know, I was very uh, blessed to have had experience of growing up with a wrestling personality like that in my life. I mean, he's legendary. So, right. Uh, yeah, yeah, very cool. Very cool. Well, that's, that's awesome. Great. And I can't think of a better way to end it. Fred, thank you again so much. We always have fun. Well, definitely uh, have to have you back on as the year sure. goes. I know there's a, there's a lot more to cover. Uh, your whole family's had such a wonderful career and you'll have to tell us how the, uh, uh, you know, we, we talked about the winter menu when we have you back on later in the year, maybe we'll talk about the, the summer menu. And when Benny stops uh, stops drooling from those those ravioli, will be that'll, uh, never, that'll never happen. <laughs> I tell you what, you know, if you guys ever have the chance to come to Rhode Island in the summertime, in any time, but particularly in the summertime where where we're at, we're right on the water. Uh, it is absolutely beautiful. It never gets old. I've seen that view yeah. like, all my whole life, uh, particularly from where I'm at now, and I'm. It's just, yeah, you, you can't find more solace than you can find in the ocean. That's for sure. Right. Absolutely. Sounds good. Well, for Fred Curry, for the player himself, Benny Scala, I'm Dan Spasciano. Have a good night. A great new year. Here's looking forward to a wonderful 2024 for Dan and Benny. Of course, Dan and Benny can be found anywhere podcasts are listed to. And a special shout out this last year. We started our uh, partnership with Monty and the Pharaoh, where we can be found on YouTube, Monty and the Pharaoh Show. And uh, it's been a great year for us, Benny, and 2024 looking to be an even bigger and better one. So, to break like I the, said, breaking the charts in Tibet. After, there you go, Charge. We'll, we'll show Cornet. We will finally, finally make him eat those words. So, again, Benny Alamoto. 
That's right. We're getting him in Tibet. We're going to Nepal. Take it away. We already we already yep. got him in Ireland. We got one more country, and we can get him twice. There we so, go. Four. James keeps going down. <laughs> for Fred Curry, for the player himself, Benny Scala. I'm Dan Sebastian. I'll have a good night, everyone, and we will see you next time we're in the ring. Happy New Year.